Hi, everyone. I'm Kurt Roney, Professor of Strategic Management at the University of Mount Olive in North Carolina and the Tillman School of Business. And uh, we're coming to you here in November of 2017. I'm sorry, of December 2017 now. It's just become December. Uh, to bring uh, a really great presentation to you by a team of very talented MBA students uh, who are going uh, to provide a strategic assessment of Nucor, uh, a steel company located uh, whose headquarters is located very close to us here in North Carolina on the other side of the state. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, a North Carolina corporation. Uh, and with that, I think what I'd like to do uh, is introduce the MC, the, the team leader, uh, Katie Stanton, and she will introduce her teammates and get us started. And uh, why she, while she's doing that, I will bring the PowerPoint slides up on the screen and we can get started. Katie? Wonderful, thank you so much. So I'd like to welcome everybody to our um, presentation of a strategic analysis on Nucor Corporation. Um, and I'll introduce my team. We have Jana, Pansy, Brittany, and Valerie. And it has been such an honor to work with them. We all started the program together, so it's wonderful that we get to finish the program together as well. Um, and we're going to start right away with the history, and I'm going to turn it over to Brittany to do that. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Katie said, my name is Brittany, and we're going to start off tonight by talking a little bit about um, Nucor's history and background, their mission, the people they serve, and the products that they make. Um, and this first slide here is just a picture um, to give you guys an idea of what the inside of a Nucor steel plant could look like. Um, so that's how we're going to get started and we're going to move on to the history. So um, at the very beginning in 1905, Ransom E. Olds, who was the founder of um, the Oldsmobile, had a argument with st his stockholders and left his own company, which was Olds Motor Works. Shortly after, he then formed the REI Motor Company, which transformed into the Nuclear Corporation of America and eventually and ultimately became Nucor. Um, fast forwarding about 50 years, in 1955, the REO Motor Company mainly relied on defense contracts in order to stay in business. So when the Korean War ended in 1955, so did REO. REO's assets were then merged with the nuclear consultants to form the Nuclear Corporation of America. In 1962, this was a very important year for Nucor um, for two reasons. They acquired a company called Bullcraft, which was an unassuming producer of steel joists and girders. And then additionally, Nucor hired Ken Iverson. Um, Ken Iverson would emerge into one of the greatest visionaries and mavericks in American history. And we'll talk a little bit um, more about him later. Um, in 1965, the company was on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, and they decided to make Ken Iverson its their new president. His first move um, to increase the company's profitability was to sell off Nucor's inefficient divisions. So um, just a year later, the company was already starting to get back on their feet and they decided to um, move their headquarters, as Dr. Roney was saying, from Phoenix, Arizona to Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and during this year, Ken Iverson proposed entering the steel making business. So three years later in 1969, the first mini mill went into production. Um, and we'll explain a little bit more about that later as well. It went into production in Darlington, South Carolina. Um, the mini mill was originally intended to provide Volcraft with an economical and reliable steel supply. But it was quickly learned that other companies had the same needs. So Nucor expanded their production to accommodate outside customers and they've been expanding ever since. Um, currently these facilities which rely on scrap metal as their main raw material source account for about 60 percent of the U.S. steel production. Um, and these mini mills are much smaller and less expensive to build. So um, 
Fast forwarding a few years later into 1979, Nucor entered the cold finish market. Um, they did this by opening a meal in Norfolk, Nebraska. Um, for just a little background information, cold finish steel is steel that has been cleaned and pickled and then rolled or drawn through dyes to produce a dimensionally accurate section with an improved surface finish. Um, moving on to 1986, um, Nucor entered into the steel fastener market um, and they opened a new production facility in St. Joe, Indiana. So Nucor Fastener, they manufacture high quality hex head cap screws, finished hex nuts, structural bolts, nuts, assemblies, flange bolts, and built to print fasteners. Two years later, in 1998, Nucor partnered with a Japanese company um, called Yamato Kagyo. I believe I'm pronouncing that correct. Um, the Nucor Yamato, Yamato plant became the first mini mill in the United States to be able to manufacture wide flange beams with a depth of 40 inches. So the next year, um, Nucor decided to, they ushered in a new era of steel making because thin slab um, technology went online at the new mini mill in Indiana. So this mill became the first mini mill in the world to be able to make quality flat rolled steel using this technology. Um, this means that the company was casting two inch slabs four to five times thinner than the industry standard, which in addition meant no more roughing mill. And roughing mill was a labor intensive thinning process for thicker flat rolled steel. Um, with this technology specifically, there was a lot of skepticism about it to begin with, and um, now it's used worldwide. So moving um, on to 1998, 11 years later, Nucor announced their plans to build a state-of-the-art plate field facility in Hertford County, North Carolina. Um, this facility, which opened two years later, um, jump-started a decade of significant growth for Nucor. So in 2000, um, the new CEO and president was named Dan D'Amico. And Dan was known for leading the company through an unparalleled period of growth and championed the ongoing fight for fair trade practices to save American jobs and our US manufacturing industry. Um, this next piece wasn't included in our timeline but looking back, I felt like it was important to mention. So in 2001, Nucor made their first acquisition in a 36 year history. Um, they acquired Auburn Steel, which then became Nucor Auburn, Auburn Steel Incorporated. So when Nucor purchased all of the assets at Auburn Steel Merchant Bar, um, it gave them a merchant bar presence in the Northeast, and it was a good source of supply for their Bullcraft Joyce facility that was under construction in New York. Um, the next year, Nucor experienced another world first. Um, the cast strip micro mill went online in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Um, this technology was producing ultra thin cast steel. Um, the process instantly transformed molten steel directly into steel sheets in just one remarkable step. Compared to an integrated steel making facility, this process consumes about 95% 95 less, 95 less energy and it emits less than one tenth the greenhouse gases. So beginning in 2004, we see that Nucor began to make several acquisitions. Um, and these acquisitions and joint ventures that they entered into helped Nucor get to where they are today. Um, by acquiring all of these different companies, they were able to enter into a lot of markets that otherwise they had not had a, pre a presence in prior to this. So I'm gonna list some of these out for you guys. Um, in 2004 and 2005, they acquired the following companies. They acquired Chorus Tuscaloosa, Fort Howard Steel, and Marion Steel. In 2006, they acquired the um, Connecticut Steel. In 2007, they acquired Harris Steel Group, and this was especially important because it provided them entry into the rebar fabrication market. Um, in addition, they acquired Magnatrax, LMP Steel and Wire, 
Nelson Steel and Harris Steel Incorporated. In 2008, they acquired David J. Joseph Company. Um, and this gave Nucor direct ownership in the steel scrap supply chain. And as well, they entered into a joint venture with, I hope I'm saying this correctly, Zufari, um, which was a company that gave them interest. Did I say that correctly, Dr. Roney? Yes. Okay. Zufari. Um, this joint venture gave them interest in interest into the European market. Um, in November of 2009, as y'all can see, Nucor was super busy. Um, the Nucor Steel Kingman recommissioned. The Kingman was a rolling mill that was acquired from North Star Steel in 2003. In March of 2010, um, two years since joining the Nucor family, David J. Joseph Company that I just mentioned added 27 locations to the company. Um, throughout five acquisitions. Um, the next month in April, they had a joint venture with Mitsui and company to form New Mint. Um, this established a presence in downstream processing for sheet steel. Um, this included 23 steel technology sheet processing facilities throughout North Carolina. So that was some major expansion. Um, I'm impressed by your ability to speak Japanese. <laughs> Thank you. You said that just right, Mitsui. I've been practicing my um, pronunciation. I'm, so, um, I'm very as you impressed. Can see, um, this past decade was a decade of growth for Nucor Steel. Um, it, during this time frame, they became the nation's leader producer, leading producer of steel. The company um, more than doubled in size to over 20,000 employees at 212 facilities in 22 states and several international locations. So moving into the next decade, um, in 2011, Nucor began development on its $750 million direct reduce iron facility, also called a DRI facility, located in St. James Parish, Louisiana. The innovative direct reduction technology converts natural gas and iron ore pellets into direct reduced iron used to produce all kinds of high quality steel products. Um, in 2012, they entered into a long-term agreement with Akana Oil and Gas Incorporated. Um, and this was important because it ensured a reliable low cost supply of natural gas for Nucor's existing and expected future needs for more than 20 years. In June of 2012, they acquired Skyline Steel, and this expanded Nucor's piling distribution and product production capabilities. The next year, um, John Ferriola assumed the role of CEO. Um, he succeeded Dan D'Amico. And this succession was important because it reflected the thoughtful and planned transition of leadership at Nucor. Um, Ferriola, who is still with the company as CEO, um, will lead the company to seize opportunities that were created by their recent investment. Um, another acquisition in 2014 was Gallatin Steel, um, which became Nucor Steel Gallatin. And this strengthened Nucor's position serving flat rolled customers in the growing pipe and tube segment. Uh, just a, a quick comment uh, for folks who are not familiar with the steel making process, but uh, you know the, the the basic ingredient of steel is iron, um, and uh, various alloying elements are added uh, to the steel as it's being made uh, to give it its various mechanical properties. But uh, the basic uh, element is iron. Uh, so being able to produce iron uh, makes Nucor uh, that much more independent of uh, supply sources when uh, the economy is expanding and uh, sources of uh, raw material, even scrap, uh, could be in short supply or very expensive. So uh, just to make sure we're, we're clear on it uh, earlier, 
uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the DRI process was described as being involved in making uh, steel. That certainly is true. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the ability to vertically integrate and to provide itself with its own source of iron uh, probably is a little bit more important uh, than a lot of people recognize when they look at uh, new course history. And uh, with that, I'll get back out of your way. <laughs> um, so in 2015, Nucor acquired Gerdau Long. <laughs> Gerdau. <laughs> okay. Gerdau Long Steel's Bright Bar. Um, the facility manufactured cold drawn steel bars for steel service centers and other markets across the U.S. And they have a combined production capacity of 75,000 tons per year. Another, um, another quick insert, Jardot is uh, the largest steel producer uh, in Brazil. It's a Brazilian corporation. And so what seems to be going on here is Jardot, uh, in, in Brazil, Brazil has a very difficult economy, and Jardot seems to be generating some cash by selling off non-core assets such as this one. Okay. Um, so kind of like you were saying, the acquisition improved Nucor's geographic coverage and it expanded the company's range of products in this important market segment. So um, most recently, toward the end of the timeline, um, in 2016 and 2017, Nucor has continued to execute its strategy for profitable growth. Um, the company has acquired a plate mill in Longview, Texas, and they announced a joint venture with JFE Steel Corporation of Japan to build a plant in central Mexico to supply that country's growing automotive market. Um, Nucor has also moved boldly into the tubing market, adding over a million tons of capacity within the, with the acquisition of the Independence Tube Corporation, Southland Tube Incorporated, and Republic Can Do It. Um, and the Southland Tube Incorporated and the Republic Can Do It were actually acquired at the beginning of this year. So moving on to the next slide, um, we're going to talk about the different industries that Nucor serves. Um, as you can see, Nucor serves the heavy equipment, the automotive, the energy, the transportation, and the construction markets. Um, for heavy equipment, Nucor makes sheet steel for the bodies of combines, plate steel for the blades of bulldozers, um, engineering bars for the, in, the engines of mining trucks, and just about everything in between. For decades, the biggest names in agriculture, construction, and mining have relied on Nucor for their broad line of quality steel products and superior customer service. In the automotive market, um, like their competitors, Nucor produces advanced high strength sheet steel, but unlike their competitors, Nucor also supplies SBQ and cold finished products throughout the automobile industries. From drive trains, frames and suspensions, to exposed body panels, to high tech components, Nucor can make steel for just about every part of your vehicle. Um, in the energy market, as you can see, it breaks down into two different segments. There is the um, power generation and transmission section, and there's oil and gas. So for the power generation and transmission segment, um, from monopoles to lattice poles, to solar, to wind, to towers, to hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams and nuclear power plants, Nucor can produce and deliver any type of steel you need to work it as well. Um, that can always confirm to, conform, excuse me, to your existing specs. In the oil and gas segment, um, we've noticed that the trend toward domestic oil production plus the recent boom in natural gas exploration and drilling means that there's more steel production going on. Um, Nucor produces more than six million tons of steel per year for the oil and gas industry. They supply for an entire range of products that can include line pipe, OGTG pipe, oil rig tooling, storage tanks, and much more. The next segment, transportation. Um, so on highway trucks, 
rail cars, barges, ships, all of these vehicles form the backbone of goods transportation in this country. And Nucor Steel Products forms the backbone of all of these. Beam, fasteners, plates, engineer bars, and sheet steel are just a few of the products that they um, manufacture that contribute to this market. And last but not least is construction. Um, Nucor makes several products to conserve the to serve the construction market as well. Um, steel beams, cold finish bars, fasteners, and joist girders are just a few of those. And Pansy is gonna speak a little bit more about each of these markets later in our presentation. Um, so this next slide, it just gives us um, more in depth list, more specifically the products that Nucor makes. Um, as you can see, they're divided up into the six sections. Carbon steel, fasteners, alloy steel, steel products, raw materials, and SDS by product. Wow. A lot of products. Um, so this slide here, it just gives us an idea of the total amount of tons of different um, different Nucor products that were sold to outside customers in 2016. As you can see here, the biggest amount of steel that was sold was the sheet steel with 37%. Where do you think most of that sheet still ends up? Uh, what kind of customers? Um, Largely automotive. Yeah. It's also the kind of steel that you would find in your a refrigerator or a stove. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, fabricated products. But the automotive industry is the biggest consumer of uh, sheet steel. Is that it? You want to change the slide? That's it. Okay. Um, up next, we have the mission statement of Nucor. Um, so Nucor is made up of more than 20,000 teammates whose goal is to take care of customers. We are accomplishing this by being the safest, highest quality, lowest cost, most productive, and most profitable steel and steel products company in the world. We are committed to doing this by being cultural and environmental stewards in our communities where we live and work. We are succeeding by working together. Taking care of our customers means all of our customers, our employees, our shareholders, and the people who purchase and use our products. So up next, we have the ABLES model. Um, and as we learn, the ABLES model helps us break down, um, further break down our mission statement. And it breaks it up into three segments, the customer groups and markets to be served, the unsatisfied needs, and the required competencies. Um, and we just talked a lot about the customer groups and markets to be served, um, the heavy equipment, automotive, energy, transportation, and construction. Um, for unsatisfied needs, we had metallurgically advanced steel, in-use application knowledge, integrated building component systems and rapid delivery. And then for the required competencies for Nucor, we had um, metallurgy and alloy development, electric furnaces, continuous casting, low cost feed materials, and then the in use application engineering. Maybe I can butt in here real quickly and just make an observation. By the way, that's, that's a good slide. Um, and I think you're doing a great job of, of covering this material too, Brittany. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> the uh, steel industry divides itself, and, and we'll probably hear more about this when we go to the industry analysis, but uh, there are various categories of steel companies. Uh, uh, Nucor and uh, one of its uh, international rivals in Korea, POSCO, uh, tend to be uh, very sophisticated in their processes. Uh, whereas other steel companies are not nearly as sophisticated as they are. Uh, some are uh, larger, uh, but uh, uh, Nucor and POSCO tend to be very sophisticated. Some others make uh, high alloy steel, very specialized kinds of steel. So there are various categories of, of steel uh, and steel companies. The, the point to be drawn from uh, that is uh, that by itself, steel is a very difficult 
uh, industry to get, get competitive advantage in. Uh, because steel is essentially steel until you uh, uh, modify it and uh, uh, make it uh, into a specialized product, either uh, it, by virtue of its physical shape or its chemical composition uh, or the uh, broad range of products that a company could make. But very difficult to differentiate uh, steel products. Uh, and uh, it's by meeting these unsatisfied needs and uh, providing itself with these uh, competences that uh, Nucor uh, and uh, uh, POSCO and uh, perhaps a couple other companies in the industry are able to differentiate themselves to the point where uh, on rare occasions they can price to price their products just a little higher because they offer just a little more, whether it's the specialized or customized nature of the product um, or, uh, or the high quality. Uh, but here you, you see uh, the sources of uh, differentiation that are possible in this industry, whether you're going to uh, tailor it to an end use industry, uh, tailor it to a specific uh, requirement uh, of the customers or and at the by uh, in order to do so uh, avail yourself of some uh, particular competences so Abel's model really helps us to focus in on uh, what's important uh, for gaining competitive advantage in this industry now that was a much too long intercession so I'll try to control myself well, you did a great job of tying my section up. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Katie so she can talk to us about environmental assessment. Okay. All right. We're going to start the environmental assessment. Um, and Pansy and I shared this section. I have the first two. Um, and then Pansy will take the second two sections. So we're going to go ahead and start with the economics. Okay. Um, and you can go ahead and skip one more slide. We should be ready. Um, so we're going to start with the GDP PPP. And that's the gross domestic product, purchasing power parity. It's kind of a tongue twister there. Um, and the PPP, that's the rate at which um, the currency of one country would have to be converted into that of another country to buy the same amount of goods and services um, in each country. Um, so it has kind of two functions, um, and it's a good tool to compare the economic performance and position of different countries. Um, since it's not subject to such extreme fluctuations on like a day-to-day -day basis, um, and it only changes marginally over a few years. Um, so this can help determine exchange rate trends in the long run um, and help with adjustments um, on exchange rates to products that have the same price when sold in different countries. So in this chart, we're looking at China, um, the United States, and the European Union. And those are kind of like your big economies. Um, and just as a side note, um, talking about the European Union, that's obviously a group of countries. So we're comparing the group of countries to China and the United States. Um, and China is a growing economy. They're very large, um, and they're very important in the overall steel industry. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. On our next slide here, um, it's still the same thing, the GDP PPP, but we're looking at India, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, and Australia. Um, so these are some emerging economies and some other economies that are growing. Um, so once again, we're looking at different costs of living and price levels relative to United States dollar. Um, and you'll see at the bottom there is India, um, and they are growing significantly. You can't see it as well on this chart as you can in the next. Um, but India is definitely economy we want to watch. And above that, in that bright blue line, um, right there next to Mexico, that's Brazil. And you can actually see they're trending downwards a little bit. And Dr. Roney touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, Brazil is going through a lot of trouble recently, politically, economically, high unemployment, high inflation. Um, so there's a lot of um, negative things, unfortunately, going on in the economy that's making them not as strong as others. On our next slide here, um, we're looking at the GDP PPP again. 
Um, but this is putting the United States, Europe, Brazil, China, and India all together. And unfortunately, it's a little light, but it was such a good chart that I found um, from the World Economic Outlook. Um, you can see how both India and China are expanding rapidly. Um, and it's growing much faster than the United States. And you can actually see there in 2013 that China surpassed the United States. Um, you can see that the United States and Europe, we are trending downwards. This is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just our economy is not growing as fast as others like China and India. That's right. Um, so this is showing the real GDP. So the real gross domestic product is an inflation adjusted measurement that reflects the value of all goods and services produced by an economy in a given year. Um, and it's expressed in a base year price. Um, so it's kind of referred to as the constant price or the inflation corrected GDP. Um, so unlike the nominal GDP, the real GDP can account for changes in price level and give a more accurate figure of economic growth. Um, so it is still the same countries we were talking about before, the United States, Europe, Brazil, China, um, India, but this is over a longer range to get a wider picture. So this chart's actually going from 1980 and then with predictions out through 2020. And it's showing you the same things. China and India are in economies we really want to keep an eye on, especially India. Yeah, there's a <laughs> sort of a basic assumption uh, that folks who look at the steel industry make and uh, that is that uh, in order to grow, economies need a steel industry or steel industries. Uh, so I can remember in uh, days gone by uh, when uh, uh, cities in the United States that were growing uh, had steel mills. I can remember in Cleveland, Republic Steel. Uh, good sized, very important steel company and it's gone now. Uh, down in Atlanta, there was the Atlantic Steel Company, and it's gone now. Uh, so as the U.S. has, uh, has matured, it hasn't needed uh, steel corporations or the steel industry quite as much, uh, not nearly as much. On the other hand, China, as you, you all know, uh, has been growing quite rapidly, and we can see it here in this chart. Now, its growth rate has slowed down some, and uh, uh, consequently, its demand for steel has also slowed down uh, in just the past year or two. Uh, needless, nevertheless, uh, in China, the biggest consumer of steel in the world has been China. And if, all, if that assumption is true, that as economies grow, they require steel in order to you know, make growth happen, whether it's in construction or transportation, what have you, then you can draw a conclusion, and that is that India is the next one to be a major consumption of, a consumer of steel. So we have an old saying that we use. Katie, are you going to say it, or do you want me to? You can say it. All right. China is the growth market of the future. India is... The what did you say? China. Oh, I'm sorry, I've messed it up. China is the growth market of the present. Yes, India, India is the, the future. Market <laughs> of the future. So the professor got an F on that one. <laughs> and I appreciate you driving home that point because that's definitely a, a really important point of with the steel market and the overall in the global economy with China and India. Um, so here we have a chart um, talking about the currency exchange rates. Um, and this is a weighted average of foreign exchange value of the, um, the United States dollar against currencies of a broad group of U.S. trading partners. So that would include places like the EU, Canada, Switzerland, Russia, Argentina. Um, and this just shows us on average how much the U.S. dollar is worth compared to other currencies. Okay. Uh, or to put it another way, how much of the other currencies are required to buy a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. And Correct. of course, as, uh, as, as that process go, has gone on since 2002, we can see uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, that 
the 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 the, the uh, and let's see if I'm getting that right. This this would reflect the um, the 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 number uh, the um, uh, amount of U.S. currency that foreign currency can buy. So long story short, over the longer term, the U.S. dollar has become more expensive in international currency trading until just recently. And that's going to have some real imp implications mm -hmm. as we go through this presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so right here we have a, the steel market outlook from November 2017. So it's pretty recent data. And we'll just start right up there um, at the top left, which is the uh, United States GDP growth. Um, and I apologize, some of these are a little bit small to see. Um, but you can see there's a little box and that's, that's pointing out the recession. And then as you can see, the, um, the GDP growth for the United States has been trending upwards. Um, next to that, we have the unemployment rate. Um, at the beginning, you can see it very high during the recession and it's trending downwards. And I actually just heard on NPR this afternoon that the feds are saying that we're getting close to about that 4% mark. So we're almost at full employment um, for the US economy. So that's a really great thing for our economy. Um, and in the, in the middle there, we have the U.S. housing starts. Um, you can see it really high at the beginning, and then that significant dip during the subprime mortgage um, whole fiasco with the, the, um, the housing bubble that popped there. And then you can see it started to trend upwards, and that's great for the construction business because we talked about steel is great for the construction business. Um, and then next to that, we have the rig counts and the oil and gas prices. Well, it's great as a consumer when the oil and gas prices are low, but for those um, in the industry, it's not that great. We want it higher. We want more spending. Um, but the one good thing, um, steel is helping in a lot of the more environmentally friendly industries, you know, natural gas, wind turbines, things like that. So that's great. We might be going a little bit down on certain industries in the oil and gas, but up in others. And then there at the bottom, we have um, the NAFTA automotive sales. Um, Pansy's probably going to talk more about this later, but I just wanted to show you this. Um, auto sales are increasing, and they're probably going to remain quite strong for a while. Since we had such a uh, devastating hurricane season, if you think about all the vehicles that are going to have to be replaced on the Gulf Coast um, and things like that, I mean, it's an unfortunate topic, but it's the truth. Um, so it's actually going to help the steel market out quite a bit. And Pansy, like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Boy, this is a great exhibit. You've got so much information in it. Uh, one quick comment about housing. Uh, some people might uh, look at that chart and say, well, what does that have to do with the demand for steel? Because there isn't much steel in houses. And they would be wrong. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a real shift. Uh, and I've worked with some clients in this industry, and I can speak from, from personal knowledge. Uh, there's a real shift uh, due to urbanization and uh, a variety of other reasons toward multifamily uh, residential structures, including condos and apartment buildings. And as we move into toward urbanization and, and uh, more people living in cities, high-rise construction is becoming a more and more important part of the uh, residential construction industry. And of course, high-rise buildings require uh, those beams that are produced by uh, Nucor and its competitors. Okay. So just to wrap up this first little section here on um, economics, um, the US GDP is trending upwards, US unemployment is low, housing markets trending upwards. These are all great signs of a strong economy. And we know strong economies, it equals spending. And spending is great, We're talking about infrastructure, housing, construction, and this is all great for the steel business. Great. And this is not just us, but also in India. <laughs> well, the, 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 okay. <laughs> Who's up now? I am up again. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the industrial economic mm -hmm. indicators. So our first thing we have here is the industrial production index. Um, and this is an economic indicator that measures real output for all facilities located in the United States, manufacturing, mining, electric, um, and the gas utilities. Um, you can see the significant drop there during the recession and then a steady climb upwards during recovery. 
Um, and you can see in 2015, it actually went above um, pre-recession levels and then dropped again, more than likely due to some um, leveling out or some readjusting um, within the economy and in um, manufacturing production. So now we're going to talk about capacity utilization. Um, and this is our durable manufacturing iron and steel products. Um, so this capacity index attempts to capture the concept of sustainable maximum output. So the greatest level of output a plant can maintain within the framework of a realistic work schedule after factoring in things like downtime and um, sufficient availability of inputs. Um, so this is specifically looking at iron and steel, like it says, and those are um, very important to Nucor. Um, once again, you can see that real sharp decline during the recession, um, and it's picked back up, but it's not quite all the way back up how it, um, it was. Um, so historically, the demand for steel fluctuates, um, both in the United States and international, um, due to its close ties to the durable and capital goods. Right, and rather interestingly, there's it appears that in the past couple of years, there's there's been another, uh, I wouldn't call it a recession, but a decline. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what is particularly interesting is that in uh, some segments of, of the uh, steel markets, uh, there's been a pickup in demand. Uh, one example is the auto industry. Uh, but uh, other segments such as uh, petroleum and energy uh, demand for steel, uh, not too many drilling, not as many drilling rigs uh, mm -hmm. being uh, produced as in the past. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are fields full of drilling rigs that aren't being used right now. So overall, we see in this chart, uh, surprisingly, uh, although there's been a recovery, uh, the recovery uh, I, I hate to use the word stalled, but it almost seems as though in the past couple of years there's been a, a slowdown. Uh, and probably what's important here is that this steel industry, as um, uh, Brittany pointed out, serves a variety of industry markets, uh, industry focused markets. And some of those industry markets uh, have not been as strong as others. So in the auto industry, Times are good, and the drilling industry, still not so good. Uh, and overall, we see the result in this chart. Um, so this here is showing the domestic steel prices, and this is not just um, Nucor. This is also other domestic suppliers, so like, um, such as US Steel and AK. Um, and sh it's showing the three different types of steel, your hot rolled, your cold rolled, and your standard plate. Um, and just as a little explanation, the difference, the hot rolled, um, it's heated up to about 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. And this allows for the metal to be shaped and formed more easily. So this would be in things such as um, for use in metal buildings. And then your cold rolled is at a room temperature um, and this increases the strength. So this would be used in things like exhaust pipes, which is in my neck of the woods with my um, career. <laughs> um, so, this is um, showing the steel prices have been relatively flat in the um, recent months. Um, there was a slight gain there in the first quarter. And I know the dates are a little hard because it's kind of compressed all there, but it's showing from 2011 through um, 2017. Um, so U.S. domestic prices for hot rolled, um, it decreased in September 2017 um, compared to a year ago. It was up 18%. Um, cold rolled prices had actually increased um, in September, about a 2.7% uh, increase from last year. Um, and the steel prices have been quite volatile recently. Um, the final selling prices are a function of multiple factors like global prices, the demand for steel, and the capacity in the industry. And you can also see the volatility in some of the stock prices of steel companies if you happen to look at those. Now, there's one place I've learned that I should not try to make a correction uh, of what Katie says, and it's when we're talking about steel prices. Uh, we all, for the you you gotta you gotta disclose all the facts here. Katie <laughs> buys steel for uh, that's her profession, so I, I, I do. I'm certainly not gonna try to get into <laughs> a discussion with her about steel prices. On to the next slide. 
<laughs> yes, steel and steel prices is my life. In uh, my group will attest, I was the one who wanted Nucor. <laughs> um, so now we're talking about import price index, and this is talking about specifically iron or steel since this is the industry we're in. Um, and this measures the average changes of price in goods and services that are imported to the United States. So once again, we're looking specifically at iron um, and steel since those are both such important um, to a new core in the industry they're in. And you can see the chart is kind of, um, you know, you have that, you climb up, you drop, you're going back up. So it's kind of all over the place. And that's what's kind of hard in the steel industry. A lot of the inputs and outputs are pretty volatile, prices, raw materials, and things like that. I think steel is one of the uh, classic cyclical industries. So we can see what happened uh, after the financial industry crisis and the impact on banking and all the industries that depend upon banking, such as construction. And of course, we had the petroleum industry uh, in experiencing its, uh, its, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, uh, crisis as well. Uh, and again, what we see is that rather remarkable little dip in, in uh, the past couple of years seems to be correcting itself as one would expect with an improving economy. Um, so this is another chart, the same idea, the import price of iron and steel mills in the ferro alloy manufacturing. And this is looking at a few different places such as Eastern Europe, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Um, and I was reading iron ore prices. Um, they've been quite volatile, like we've been talking about, um, due to the excessive supply. And it's probably going to continue into 2018. I know this chart stops at July 2017, but you can start to see it trending upwards again. Um, and actually, some mines are going to be coming back um, into use um, and that have left the market because of the high prices. They want to get back in on that. So back to talking about capacity. Um, this is showing the global capacity. Sorry. Nope, you're fine. Okay. Did I do something wrong? Go back. You you need to go to the next slide for me. Next. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so we talked earlier about capacity utilization for the United States, but this is the global um, overhang in the steel market. Um, and as we've mentioned quite a bit, steel is a global um, uh, industry. I mean, what happens, yes, <laughs> what happens in China and other Asian um, steel mills and areas, it's going to affect the United States at some point and vice versa. Nucor just raised their prices, the Asian markets are going to start raising their prices. It all goes together. Um, so when there's excess capacity in steel, steel mills, um, the prices are going to be lower. The mills are going to be a lot more willing to negotiate, and they're going to be out there trying to get business. Um, so when there's not as much capacity, prices are going to be very high, and they're not going to want to take orders. Um, China is specifically called out in here because they're one of the largest players in the steel industry, um, and it's extremely hard to um, compete with China in their prices because the government subsidizes their mills. And there's a lot of things going on, um, and Pansy will briefly touch on that. There's just so much you could talk about with that. It could take a whole two-hour presentation by itself. Um, so back specifically talking about the U.S., since our company, Nucor, is a domestic steel supplier, um, you can see um, that the domestic mills have been operating at about 74%. Um, so they're um, they're getting up there, they're full, but they're not quite, there's still a little bit of wiggle room um, for uh, price negotiations and things like that. Um, but um, the utilization has actually been up uh, since uh, in August 2017, uh, utilization was about 75, an increase of 1.5% from July. Um, and Utilization has increased almost 24, 25% since the 13 year low that the steel industry experienced in 2009. So right there in the recession, um, although we're still kind of below the pre-recession um, levels. Right. Uh, this is talking about quarterly net income through quarter two of 2017. It starts quarter one of 2009. Um, and this is looking at a few of the big guys in the United States, AK, 
new core steel dynamics, U.S. steel. Um, and the U.S. steel industry has um, posted a combined net income of $864 million in quarter two of 2017. Um, and a with all available um, figures, uh, all six have uh, reported net gains. So they're doing quite well. And Nucor actually represented the highest net profit um, in quarter two. Um, you can see that really um, low dip there in quarter one, 2016. And actually it was a little bit lower from um, this, you would think it'd be lower there in 2009. And there were some uh, a few things going on there in 2015, 2016, and it actually had to do with the Chinese market. Um, their purchasing managers index dropped significantly, commodity stocks fell, and it really reverberated through to the United States market with the Chinese slowdown. The demand was low, prices started going down, and the U.S. Um, steelmakers really didn't have a choice but to lower their prices as well. So it just kind of points out that what happens around the world also affects um, us in the United States and the steel industry. Um, so this is just a quick sh chart showing the bond yields. Um, we have Moody season um, AAA bonds on top and then the government bonds below. Um, you can see the decline in the interest rates, which is a good thing. Interest, lower interest rates, more attractive to borrow. And as we've talked about, Nucor is really big into um, acquiring. So that's great for debt financing and things of that nature. So the, the, as the, when the interest rates went down, that made it easier for Nucor to borrow uh, in order to uh, acquire the funds necessary to make these acquisitions. Is that your point? I think so. Yeah. Also, I would imagine that uh, as interest rates come down, it becomes easier uh, for Nucor's customers to add to their capacity, even though mm -hmm. uh, capacity utilization uh, in, generally in the U.S. Is, is improving, but it's not that high. Uh, there's a lot of old uh, industrial uh, capacity in the United States that does need to be replaced and, and uh uh, replenished, and so with lower, with interest rates being low, uh, as demand for those capital expenditures increases, uh, at least the cost of financing uh, isn't something that uh, creates a barrier. It is true that interest rates have started uh, to move back up again, as you can uh, see uh, somewhat in the lower chart there for the United States. You see in the bottom chart, you've got uh, essentially the cost of working capital financing uh, in the U.S., uh, Germany, uh, and, uh, and England, and Canada. But the U.S., uh, you can see the rates are, are moving back up again. Yeah. Um, and so just to wrap up this section here, um, production utilization has remained strong as the economy uh, rebounds from the global recession. Um, just to point out, the domestic mills are operating at about 74% capacity and bond yields are trending downwards. And now I'm going to um, hand it over to Pansy, who's going to talk about the industry structure. Hello, thank Pansy. You. Hey, thank you, Katie. Um, we'll move on to the first slide. Okay. So um, with this slide, um, what it's showing is for most of the last decade, global crude steel production has been growing. Production totaled 1.1 billion metric tons in 2005, and by 2015 had grown 41.4% to 1.6 billion metric tons. This was an increase of 475 million metric tons over a 10-year period. Global production dipped in 2009, just, if you, just as you've been hearing about, following the global financial crisis, but rebounded quickly in 2010. Then in 2014, global production hit a record high of 1.67 billion metric tons. Weak global demand for steel in 2015 caused a slight contraction in crude steel production worldwide, decreasing at 2.8% from 2014. The World Steel Association forecasted relatively stagnant steel demands levels for 2016 and 2017, which would indicate that production may hold steady at current levels in the near future. 
if you could go back one, I'm not, I'm still on that. Yeah, thank you. Crude steel production growth rates reinforced the upward production trend of the past decade. Since 2006, there have been only three years that have had negative growth. And the majority of the years in which um, the steel industry had positive growth, it was greater than 5%. Okay, now we'll move to the next one. What this slide is showing us is the changes in the steel um, industry over the past 50 years. In 1967, we can see that the United States was shown as the top producing company. And, there, and at, in that same year, China is shown in the ninth position. But by the year 2000, China had become number one and the United States had dropped to the number three. Also of note, by 2000, India appears on the scene. They are in the ninth position during that year. By the end of 2016, India surpassed the United States and is shown in the third position, while the United States dropped to number four, but China remained on top. It's important to note, just as you've heard in, in our presentation previously, the steel production business is indicative of the growth that is going on in that country. That is why we see India join the top steel producing countries because they are in a growing stage currently. The next slide is just, just briefly, um, wanted to put up this slide so that you would know where our company sits. Um, and here we see that Nucor holds the number 12 spot as a top steel producing company in the world. Next. Okay. Uh, rather interesting, uh, just to, to take a look, ArcelorMittal, uh, a European country, is by far the largest uh, here. Um, another thing that might be worth noting is that uh, although China, a Chinese company is number two, if we were to add up all of the Chinese companies uh, on this uh, list, we would uh, we would uh, by far have larger uh, production than anywhere else, which you've already observed, China being number one. Yes. By the way, POSCO's uh, arch rival uh, is, uh, is a lot larger in its output, uh, but, and it is the new core of Asia. Uh, and you, you, you might ask, or people who are watching this, uh, broadcast might ask uh, why it would POSCO be uh, so much larger than Nucor and of course the answer is its location right POSCO is located right across the bay from the largest consumer and producer of steel and cars in the world so POSCO's market uh, location, uh, geographic location gives us a marketing advantage. All right, good. So this slide, um, thank you, Dr. Rooney. This slide um, shows us the domestic, cap um, domestic capacity of steel makers with greater than 2 million tons capacity. So this chart on the left shows that 22 U.S. companies fell in this category in 2000. And by 2017, that number had decreased to number 10, although Nucor um, stays in the number one slot throughout this time. A personal note, I used to be with U.S. Steel, <coughs> and I can remember when U.S. Steel was number one in the United States, and we were, uh, frankly, we were first in the world. Oh, we were so proud. <laughs> oh, those were the days. <laughs> I bet. Um, this slide talks about um, some current information on U.S. imports of steel mill products, which has increased in recent months after declining in the second half of 2016, while exports have remained relatively flat. In August of 2017, the steel trade deficit narrowed to negative 2.2 million metric tons, and that was from a previous negative 2.4 million tons in July of 2017. This was an 8.2% decrease. Compared to the trade balance one year ago, the August 2017 steel trade gap has widened by 9.5%. From July to August 2017, 
the volume of U.S. steel exports increased 13.8% to 832,000 metric tons. In August of 2017, exports were up 13% from one year ago. Imports decreased by 3% by volume between July and August 2017 to 3.1 million metric tons. In August of 2017, imports were up 10.4% from one year ago. So in the next slide, we see that raw materials, um, and here, um, these are the types of materials that are used to run electric arc furnaces that you'll hear more about later. A period of sustained high capacity utilization in the industry from 2005 eventually caused an extreme peak in the market for steel, which peaked in 2008 and dropped drastically towards the end of 2009. The shaded area on this chart indicates a U.S. recession. The steel industry entered the recession in the best of health, and so it was able to emerge as a leading indicator of what lies ahead. The next chart um, has a lot of information on it. The big takeaway that I would say um, from this slide is that there is a rise in raw material prices. Metal prices hit record highs in both iron ore, which peaked in February of 2011, and steel scrap, which, which peaked in July of 2008. On the next slide, we learned that by evaluating Nucor using Porter's five forces that pressures of, on profitability of the steel industry are generally high. These mm -hmm. pressures stem um, from its commodity nature and the nature of its input, put, excuse me, such as iron ore, steel scrap, and energy and labor. Pansy? Yes, sir? Uh, just to clarify something real quickly here. Uh, we're using Porter's five forces to assess the steel industry now. We're not using it to assess a company, uh, but rather the industry. I, I know that was probably just a verbal slip, but for those who are listening, let's make, make sure that we're, we're clear that we use Porter's five forces to identify the profit potential of an industry. And having done that, then to identify, that's when we, we look at the impacts on a company to identify uh, priority, uh, strategy priorities. So first we wanna know what the forces pushing uh, profit down in an industry are. Then we, we identify uh, priorities for strategy to respond to those forces. Uh, pardon me for interrupting, but again, I just want no, to make sure that nobody gets misled here. Why don't you go ahead and start with uh, rivalry again, because uh, I've really interrupted your flow here. That's, a, that's okay. So um, just to talk about the steel industry, like Dr. Um, Roney said, and I appreciate you clarifying that, um, competitive rivalry is high in the steel industry. Threat of new entrants is low. Threat of substitution is moderate. Buyer power is moderately high, and supplier power is moderately high. So if we'll move on to the next slide, we'll talk about some steel, um, the industry structure conclusions. Um, here we see that global crude steel production has grown over the last decade. Top country for steel production has moved from the United States in 1967 to China in 2016. The U.S. steelmakers with over 2 million tons capacity companies have, redu have reduced from 22 in 2000 to 10 in 2017 and pressures on profitability of the steel industry are generally high. Based Next. on the results of our five forces assessment? Yes, sir. Okay. So the next um, section that we're gonna move into is markets, and we'll go on to the next slide. So on the left, you see that steel shipments um, by market classification, this is showing for 2016, construction holds the largest piece of this business with automotive following a, as the second largest. The information shown in the chart to the right is representative of the shifts within the market classification. As you can see by, by looking at the trend chart to the right, 
steel shipments by market classification have really not changed significantly over the past seven years. With, with perhaps one or two uh, exceptions, we can see quite remarkably uh, that, and by the way, we've got to read these things and re not from left to right, but from right to left. Is that right? Uh, so the bar, the brown bar on the right is 2010, and the yellow bar on the left is 2016. Correct. It it goes from 16 on the left. Yes. Yeah. So so to 2010 on the right. So. Right. We read these things from right to left rather than left to right. Um, that, and I must confess that when I first looked at uh, this chart, uh, I read it backwards because I read things from left to right. That's why I'm pointing it out for everyone else. Of course, everyone else probably is a little sharper reader than I am, but just uh, to be on the safe side. Uh, and so we can see an increasing cons uh, consumption of steel uh, in the automotive industry since the, uh, the recovery began. Uh, we see, uh, because construction's a lagging industry, uh, construction contracts, uh, uh, once they're put in place, can last two or three years or sometimes even longer. So it takes a while for them after the recession begins to make their effects known, and then it takes them uh, longer once the recovery gets started uh, again, to make the effects uh, of the recovery apparent, but we can see uh, in the uh, most recent uh, year, 2016, uh, we're benefiting from both improvements in construction, which includes industrial, commercial, as well as residential and even highway construction, all of which can benefit uh, the steel industry. So in auto and construction, life is good, uh, and as we commented earlier, if you look all the way over on the left side of the chart, you can see that energy is still in a, in a non-growth mode. Uh, the good news is it's not as big a factor as the other two industries. So in this, um, in this slide, um, we see that the information from the end use industries production revenue and profit trends and the chairman of the world steel economics committee recent said the economic environment facing the steel industry continues to be challenging with china's slowdown impacting globally across a range of indicators contributing to volatility in financial markets sluggish growth in global trade and low oil and other commodity prices. The global steel market is suffering from insufficient investment expenditure and continued weakness in the manufacturing sector. In 2016 um, was forecast to be another year of contraction in the steel demand in China. Slow but steady growth in some other key regions including NAFTA and the European Union is expected. Growth for steel demand in all markets except China is expected in 2017 and there are several downsides um, to this information one is that the Chinese real estate market and corporate debt problem two anxiety in the financial markets three high household debt and volatile capital flows in many emerging economies geopolitical tension and unstable political situations in several regions could further worsen the global economic environment on a positive note, some emerging economies in the South and Southeast Asia show resilient growth and along with NAFTA and the European Union will support a recovery in 2017. We expect that steel demand outside of China will continue to grow by 1.8% in 2016 and this growth should accelerate to 3% to in 2017. Those are those are really good points. Uh, it just, it just for perspective, uh, take a look at the size uh, of the uh, numbers in Asia compared to the size of the numbers elsewhere in the world. Uh, and although there may have been a little downturn in Asia, it still is the 10,000 pound gorilla in the market. 
All right, on the next slide, we talk about, here we are looking at crude steel production for the period. This is a short period of time from April 16 through September of 17. In the European Union, France produced 1.3 metric tons of crude steel in, 2000, in September of 2017, an increase of 3.2% compared to September of 2016. Italy's crude steel production for September 2017 was 2.2 metric tons, which is up 8.3% from September of 16. Spain produced 1.3 metric tons in September 2017. Turkey's crude steel production for September 2017 was 3.0 metric tons. The U.S. produced 6.7 metric tons of crude steel in September of 2017, which represents an increase of 8.6% compared to September of 2016. And now to go into a little more detail on, as Dr. Roney was pointing out, the auto industry should see a spike in demand due to an overactive hurricane season. We heard that from Katie. That has already started to materialize, as you can see, in the later months of 2017. Still suppliers are planning for this, so we should be okay. Nucor particularly said that they see the, uh, see the general, generally stable or improving conditions for our most important end markets, including non-residential construction, automotive, energy, heavy equipment, and agriculture. AK Steel was somewhat more circumspect on end steel demand. The company said our core market of automotive has clearly softened a bit, from the records levels of 2016. They also said, looking at the full year, most industry sources are now predicting a modest year-over-year -year -year decline of approximately 3% in light vehicle build rates in North America. However, the company sees low and steady growth rates in residential and non-residential construction sectors. This graph is showing the highway construction, and just like many of the other charts that we've looked at, there's a dip um, between 2008 and 2010 um, with the financial crisis, but there has been a continued steady upward trend since then. And the most recent quarters do show some decrease in growth, but are expected to rally um, rapidly. In the construction industry, it accounts for approximately 40% of steel consumption in the United States. The construction sector includes commercial housing, infrastructure, and non-residential construction. Being the largest consumer of steel, construction activity remains a key driver for steel companies. It affects the overall steel market as well as prices for steel products. Nucor gets almost half of its revenue from the construction industry. Within this sector, it is, it's also heavily dependent on the fortunes of non-residential construction. And something of particular interest to me, where if you look at the photos that are shown there, um, one of the photos you can see building a house using the steel. Um, I think Dr. Roney talked about that a little bit earlier. And so it, I thought it was interesting that we have that shown here too. But if we'll move to the next slide, we'll look at energy. Energy is of critical importance to the North American steel industry, as the production of steel is inherently energy intensive. The industry consumes substantial amounts of electricity, natural gas, coal, and coke to make our products and energy. It is approximately 20% or more of the cost of producing a ton of steel. There are two types of energy used in the manufacturing sector, energy consumed for fuel and energy consumed for feedstock. Energy consumed as fuel includes all energy used for heat, power, and electricity generation, regardless of where the energy was produced. Net electricity is included in the energy consumed as fuel. However, net electricity does not include electricity from on-site generation or combustible fuel sources. Energy used as feed stock, sometimes referred to as non-fuel, is the energy used 
for raw, as raw material for purposes other than heat, power, electricity generation. For instance, the steel industry coal is used as a raw material to produce coal coke. The, industry, the steel industry used over 1.1 quadrillion BTUs of energy in its fuel in 2006. Nearly all of the industry's fuel consumption came from one of the four energy sources, coke and breeze, natural gas and other, and that's what's shown in the chart um, above. The other fuel co constitutes two major byproduct fuels, coke oven and blast furnace gases. These two byproducts fuel a can these two by, by, blah, blah, blah. These two byproduct fuels account for 99% of the other fuel that is shown above. On the next slide, we will talk about the regulation and the steel market, um, otherwise known as Section 232. Earlier this year, the Trump administration ordered a probe under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. Um, and this, um, a similar probe was also ordered for aluminum imports. President Trump may be using the 232K simply as a bargaining tool to get China or other um, presumed trade offenders to negotiate. But the bottom line is, if the Trump administration finds the steel and aluminum imports pose a security threat, it will have the power to impose tariffs. This is not just a one-sided issue, however, the European Union has already warned of retaliation in response to U.S. steel tariffs. In addition, other U.S. manufacturers are worried that there wouldn't be enough supply to keep up with demand and that already high U.S. steel prices would continue to rise due to limited availability. This could further strain the military as well, since there may not be enough domestic steel available for the sector's needs. So this is a complex issue that is being watched very closely by just about everyone in the industry sphere. We look forward to seeing how the results turn out and how it will impact U.S. manufacturing as a whole. Obviously, domestic steel suppliers would like to see more demand and higher prices, but realistically, this could really hurt the U.S. economy. There is just not enough domestic capacity to fulfill all domestic demand. U.S. steel imports stood at 3.5 million metric tons in June of 2017, according to preliminary data from the U.S. Census Bureau, and that's the highest on record since January of 2015. On the next slide is a um, summary of the steel market analysis. And here we, the steel market has remained consistent with some variations which we've gone to, through in detail for almost a decade as seen in the market trends graphed earlier and shown again to the right. Construction and automotive remain the two largest consumers of steel, making up over 65% of total steel market. Construction showed a decrease in, from 2012 through 2014 but has rebounded in 2015 and 2016. Although automotive industry is showing a slight reduction over the last few years, you can see in the automotive slide that, I show, that we talked about earlier that it appears to be on a rebound in 2017. And the final subject that I will talk about, I know you're all tired of hearing me talk, is the steel industry social contract. So we have many challenges to overcome as a global society. We are faced with resource shortages, water and land stress, environmental degradation, and climate change. There are also many needs to be met from poverty eradication to mitigation of natural disasters. The challenges are magnified by a population set to grow from the present to 9.7 billion by 2050 accompanied by rap rapid urbanization, as Dr. Roney mentioned earlier. It is clear that things cannot go on as they have and that we must transition to a green economy in which economic growth and environmental and social responsibility work hand in hand. 
The steel industry believes that sustainable development must meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Within this, a green economy delivers prosperity for all nations, wealthy and poor alike, while preserving and enhancing the planet's resources. The transition to a green economy is already underway and presents countless opportunities for positive change. Steel has an essential role to play in this transition and in sustaining a green economy. Steel is critical to the sectors and technologies that will enable and drive a green economy. Renewable energy, resource and energy efficient buildings, low carbon transport, in infrastructure for fuel efficient and clean energy vehicles and recycling facilities all depend on steel. In fact, steel cans are the most recycled food package in the world, giving steel an important role in providing sustainable packaging for foods that carry important nutrients essential to a healthy diet. So the sustained economic value creation and distribution is possible when companies innovate and remain competitive in the market. The economic value created by a company changes over time as we've learned in this course, due to technological innovations and improvements in efficiency. In the context of sustainability, companies create economic value which is captured by stakeholders in various forms. The economic value generated by companies can be distributed to stakeholders and reinvested in the firm. The steel industry is an important generator of wealth and value in society and distributes the majority of this to a wide range of stakeholders. The remainder is reinvested in the company to promote long-term growth and innovation. And now we're gonna hear from Jana. All right, so we're gonna start um, and go over the capabilities analysis. So these are the new core locations um, as indicated in the 2016 annual report of new core. So moving on, we'll go ahead and discuss new core sales. As you can see, new core sales dipped during the recession as indicated in 2009. The decrease in backlog orders in the steel product segment was due to the economic downturn, which was particularly severe in the non-residential construction market. The mar construction market represented a significant percentage of sales for their steel meals and steel product segment as we've pre previously discussed. And additionally, the decrease in sales was due to an overcapacity in China, the world's largest producer and consumer of steel, and has the potential to result in farther increase in imports of low-priced, unfairly traded steel and steel products to the United States. They began to regain, oh, sorry, back to sales. Yep, they began to uh, regain traction after the recession, but starting in 2014, another sales dip was observed. Overproduction and global steelmaking capacity continue to be a significant challenge for Nucor and the entire U.S. steel industry. With the U.S. economy performing better than most of the other economies around the world in 2014, the U.S. steel market was the destination of choice for global steel producers. So in 2014 alone, total steel imports increased 38% compared to 2013, hindering Nucor's market share Imports increased from nearly every steel producing country and in virtually every category of steel products. These imports were sometimes artificially priced, which made it very difficult for Nucor to maintain their sale prices and their profit levels. So moving on to their operating margin. Nucor really begins to shine with their operating margin as the company trends are typically in the top of the industry. The profit and the sales as they went down in 2009, as we just discussed, due to the recession, but so did the operating margin. Typically, this happens because the company must continue to pay for those variable costs, the cost to be in business. Additionally, Nucor Cash Strip Arkansas began operation, Nucor Trading was launched, and Nucor Steel, um, Steel Kingsman was recommissioned. All of that happened within 2009. So as we move on to um, the return on investment just maybe, maybe just before we do move on, Jana, sure. uh, we see recently an improvement in uh, operating margins. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a nice improvement. 
And uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about a great deal with Nucor is that Nucor has uh, divisions that produce building components uh, and uh, really substantial amounts of building components, whether uh, as joists or trusses or uh, whole gantries, but whole uh, uh, you know structural uh, steel components for buildings, not just the raw, the basic steel product that the steel components are made out of, but the actual components themselves. And if we go back to Nucor's history, we remember that originally, uh, you know, the Nucor didn't make steel, it made building components. And we've also seen in the dis uh, discussion of uh, the industries that Nucor serves, as well as the economy, that there's been a pickup uh, in construction, particularly uh, commercial and industrial construction. And <clears throat> the profit margins uh, where value is added to the steel by making it into uh, a final product rather than just the raw material that goes into the final product enables uh, manufacturers to charge higher prices and get higher profit margins. And so even though sales have been sluggish in re recent years, as we just saw, we can look at that very quickly, we see the sales are down, and yet the profit margin's up. Uh, why is that? And partially it's because of the uh, mix of products sold by Nucor and the opportunity to generate higher profit margins from finished products rather than basic uh, raw material, uh, basic products. Uh, I'll turn it back to you now, Jana. So within the return on invested capital, the same pattern is observed that was seen within the operating margin with the dip in 2009. Um, like the return on investment, 15% or higher is okay, but 20% would be ideal. Yeah. And neither of these numbers Nucor is currently hitting or they need. Uh, these are not smiling numbers. No, they're not. Um, so moving on, the return on equity. Return on equity, just as an overview, is the amount of net income returned as a percentage of shareholders' equity, and it measures a corporation's profitability by revealing how much profit a company generates with the money that shareholders have invested. So as specific to Nucor, this is a lukewarm growth rate, the growth rate of shareholders' wealth. This graph depicts the basic rate of return to shareholders. Yeah, uh, people often uh, misunderstand it. I think you read a, a sort of a standard definition and mm -hmm. then you got to the growth rate part. Uh, quite simply, uh, you know, the way we make money, the way we, we retain earnings and build equity is through earnings, through net income. And so uh, the return on equity is simply a growth rate in uh, shareholders' equity before things happen such as the payment of dividends or selling more stock. Uh, and again, uh, you know, a 10% growth rate in shareholder wealth isn't, isn't bad. Unfortunately, we do have things uh, to deal with like dividends and stock buybacks and, uh, and so forth. So 10% uh, is, is, is moderate, moderately okay. Uh, but just as Jana would have liked to see us making a, higher rate of return on invested capital, I think we'd also like to see Nucor doing a little better job in growing equity. Um, Nucor tends to be fairly conservative in regard to debt. Lots of debt was taken on by Nucor in 2009 and 2010 due to the David Joseph company adding 27 locations in a joint venture with Mitsui and company to form Numit. Um, and these are all items that Brittany discussed earlier, but all of these opportunities created additional debt. Additionally, the long-term debt saw an 88% increase in 2012, as additional debt was taken on due to a major expansion of the SBQ production. Nucor entered into the long-term agreement with Encana Oil and Gas and the acquisition of Skyline Steel. Stockholders' equity is the net of debt value of a company. When an increase occurs in the stock in the company's earnings or capital, the overall result is an increase of the company's stockholders' equity balance. And so in 2007, the stockholders' equity increased drastically due to the increase of paid in capital 
often the issuance um, of new shares through acquisitions, but also the retained earnings as Newport made money within that current year, but the accumulation of comprehensive income, which are often valuation changes. So those all played into the increase of stockholders' equity. Yeah, uh, and just to appreciate, you know, what we're looking at, if we look at uh, where uh, the company began at the end of 2007 at about $5 billion of net worth, uh, by the end of 2008, it's 60% higher at $8 billion. That's $3 billion of increase, not all of which came from earnings, right? We sold stock uh, in addition. So that was a real boost in, uh, in shareholder wealth. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the shareholders at the end of 2007 had to deal with some dilution because of all those additional uh, shares of stock that were sold in order to, in, to uh, build this, this amount of equity. Um, Nucor's business is capital intensive. So therefore, as noted within Nucor's 10K report for 2007 and 2008, Cash was used in investing activities, which represents the capital expenditures for new facilities, the expansion and upgrading of existing, existing facilities, and the acquisition of other companies. Additionally, the cash used um, in investing activities includes investment in joint ventures and purchases of uh, proceeds from the sale of investment. Um, specific within the increase, as you can see on the chart, the cash used in investing activities increased from $3.32 billion in 2008 compared to $856.1 million in 2007. So it was a drastic increase. Uh, $1.2 billion was of new facilities and expansion for upgrading of existing facilities in 2008 compared to the $520.4 million in 2007, an increase of about 96%. Nucor has made significant acquisitions in 2007 and 2008, and the two largest were the David Joseph in 2008 and the Harris Steel in 2007. Nucor has since used the David Joseph and Harris Steel as growth platforms for the raw material and steel product segments, respectively. Okay, just remember that the uh, invested capital is the sum of debt and equity, right? That's, that's it. Uh, if we add the long-term debt and equity, uh, there may be some other minor items, but that, that's basically it. Uh, we get total capital invested. Uh, and uh, Jenna was then talking about uh, what the uses of that in ca invested capital uh, were. Uh, but this is the I in ROI, right? So uh, in order to get a good return on invested capital as the amount of capital invested goes up, we've got to increase operating profit accordingly uh, to keep pace with that or our rate of return will go down. And uh, it, when shortly after we make these capital investments, we don't often get increases in profit right away. So sometimes when we make these large investments, uh, rates of return go down uh, temporarily anyway until we begin to get the, those investments uh, productive. <clears throat> Perfect. So with the leverage, I was going to um, briefly talk about the circle as well. Um, so it comes from two sources, the debt and equity. And um, debt is about 80%, as you would use in your example, and then the equity was 20%. So the invested capital, as we just saw, would be about 100. But um, with the leverage, the, lots of debt was taken on by Nucor, as we discussed in 2010, with the David Joseph adding 27 locations in a joint venture of Masui and company to form NUMIT. Um, these opportunities created that additional debt. Nucor overall seems to be fairly conservative mindset as they work down their debt before acquiring new debt. Um, additional debt was taken on in 2012 due to those major expansions that we previously discussed. Um, but as they're working down their debt, we're anticipating that there might be some acquisitions to come. Critical success factors are functional capabilities that distinguish the winners from the losers um, in the rivalry of competitive advantage. These functional capabilities are incorporated within the cr critical success factor report card. And so for our success factor report card, we rank Nucor amongst competitors in the following categories. 
metallurgy, employee productivity, moderate leverage, and operations technology. After scoring each individual category of overall grades, POSCO received an A, followed by Nucor with a B. Um, for example, POSCO and Nucor are considered to be technological leaders, where U.S. Steel and ArcelorMittal are not. Um, and of those, ArcelorMittal are, is the least of the four. Other critical success factors that we could have discussed would have been um, chemical engineering, low average age of fixed asset, assets, advanced energy management systems, moderate melting and continuous casting systems, low-cost sources of iron ore, and scrap steel, and locations of meals being close to the market. So now mm. I'm going to turn it... Very good. So now I'm going to turn it over to Valerie for the strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. <clears throat> I will be touching base on some of no code, uh, new core strengths. And the first one is uh, relatively low cost in production, where a new core has a variable cost structure, unlike companies like US Steel and AK Steels. Because of its variable cost structure, new core is better placed to cope with velocity and steel prices. New core sensitive to spot steel prices is lower than U.S. steels. <clears throat> the electric furnace. One of the distinguished features of new core business is its use of electric eight art mini, mini mills. These faculties are more flexible than the blast furnace that underpin competitors like AK Steel's blast furnace needs to run at high utilization rates to turn a profit while electric arc mills are, to simplify a bit, easy to turn on and off as demand merits. Continuing, continuous casting allow metals and owls to be stretched, shaped, and solidifies without the need for an interruption, reducing waste while improving yield, cost efficiency, and quality. Introduced into the steel manufacturing in 1950 as an alternative to Ingor molds, the continuous casting machine has now become a standard in premium battery grid production using a series of rollers and weight and water cooler molds, the process lessen the chance of impurities and provide better thickness ratios. Capital investment in new operations. New core steel made a capital investment of 4.4 million last year at its steel manufacturing plant in Dakota. The plant brought new equipment for Nucor's hot meal picket line, pickled line, allowing for a broader range of products to reach additional markets and attract new customers. The investment will not directly create any new jobs at Nucor Dakota site which has 730 employees and an annual payroll of more than 85 million before benefits. Mm -hmm. Utilizing scrap steel, that is only one piece of the cost puzzle. New core mills also make heavy use of their scrap metal which Nucor gets from its own scrap yard. Nucor have been building direct reduced iron ore faculties, which gives it another source of metal that can be used to make steel. Direct reduction iron ore smelting. Producing steel requires a good deal of iron ore. 
steel production firms that use electric arc furnace in their steel production process have, tra tra have tra traditionally fed their EFAs with scrap iron or smelting pig iron. However, due to the rising price of high quality scrap iron, and the high capital expense of smelting, firms have began to look for alternative iron sources. Nucor, in particular, have had success in finding a cheaper alternative by building direct reduction iron plants. Direct reduction iron, DRI, is produced by the reduction of iron oxen using hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide derived from natural gas. Due to the large quality of mass gas used in this process, Nucor have strategically built plants in areas that produce plentiful natural gas. Nucor first built a DRI plant in Trinidad in 2006 and experienced significantly cost savings in producing 2 million tons of iron pedals a year. Then in 2011, Newcorp broke ground on another DRI plant in Convert, Louisiana and began producing iron pellets in 2014. These new DRI plants have changed new core business models significantly by creating another option for producing the iron that feeds their electric arc furnace. In 2013, a year before the opening of new core Louisiana DRI facility, the cost of scrap iron was about $390 a ton. However, the cost of producing iron pellets in a DRI plant was only about $280 a ton. These lower produce, production prices have also allowed Nucor to see profit margins that are much greater than those of their competitors. Direct reduced iron may be the way of the future in steel production. Okay, I'm going to go to um, ENU's Industrial Knowledge, which is um, Nucor, Human Resource Management. Nucor understands the importance of, R of HRM. Since the start of the company, Nucor has placed a strong emphasis on its workers. Historically, Nucor has had a decentralized management system based on incentive. The management philosophy at Nucor has historically been informed based mainly on principle of honesty, empowerment, and responsibility. Managers seek to create product, productive and cooperative workforce based on fairness. Innovative technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nucor rebirth was sparked by innovative innovation, making steel from recycled scrap on a large scale than had ever been tried. Since then, Nucor has thrived on intellect risk taking. Based on the success of its bar mill in the 1980s. Nucor adapt a technology developed in Germany to make sheet steel starting from a slab much thinner than standard meals while we're making. Rory wrote allegedly report explain, explaining, explaining why the technology would never work. But in Crawfordsville, Indiana, Nucor built the world's first thin slab sheet meal. The mill changed the industry in two ways. It showed that sheet mill, sheet steel mills could be built much smaller, 
and with a much smaller investment than the giant mills that had dominated the business. It demonstrated that many mills could become significant players in the large sheet steel business. Nucor also worked with their customers and their steel industry to drive innovative in their products. Nucor teammates have developed advanced high strength lightweight steel for auto manufacturers that is strong enough to absorb energy dorm crash and light enough to meet new fuel economic standards. In anticipation of further innovation in the automobile industry, Nucor is also providing technical support to the further future steel vehicle program and collaborate effects led by the World Steel Association to develop fully engineered system intense design for electrified vehicles that reduce greenhouse gas emission over their entire life cycle. You want the next slide now, Valerie? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Oh, no. No? You want to stay here? Um, let me see. I had one more. Uh, yes, I sir. I are ready to move on to the, the weaknesses. Um, okay. That's fine. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Go to the weaknesses. Um, New Corps has a high demand on U.S. Um, domestic market. Is mainly because shown on the um, company's supply and pricing standard, it changes as the domestic market alters. Additionally, there is a risk of market diversification as it derives most of its revenue from the U.S. This exposes them to the fluctuation in the U.S. economics as demand for steel will decrease when the economics shaken. You can go to the next one. Okay. This is a picture of some of the steel products that uh, Nucor uh, makes, which is the steel beams that for like a um, airport hanger and the thin small roll of steel and a high beam for high rise buildings. Okay. Yeah, boy, that's classy stuff. By the way, those big rolls are the, are sheet steel. Sheet steel. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, those rolls are delivered to plants like automotive plants, and they're put up on racks, uh, and they're unrolled just like toilet paper. And so the steel strip is, un, is unrolled, it's pull, just pulled off the roll, and the product is stamped, whether they're going to be parts for washing machines or parts for uh, the, uh, the external uh, body of, of a car. Uh, that's how uh, sheet steel is delivered and used. On to the organization. Yes, sir. Let me, <laughs> let me miss my paper. Mess well, up my paper. Goals. Goals is the, um, to take care of their customers, oh. employees, are encouraged to fix the things they see as wrong and have real power on their job. Oh, now, wait a minute. Are we talking about the organization here? Um, my papers got mixed up. Well, let me, let me give you a little hand here uh, so that we can move right along. Uh, okay. This is the uh, structure uh, of, uh, of the organization. And uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, uh, the various product categories uh, up, uh, can be matched up to the end use uh, markets. So uh, we see uh, that uh, the uh, merchant and rebar products, for instance, those are very basic products. Rebar, of course, used in, in bridges and the like, re called reinforcing bar. Uh, merchant products are very basic. On the other end, we get the flat rolled product like shield, uh, sheet, the, the uh, a sheet steel that we just looked at. And, and there we find automotive and appliance uh, customers consuming that product. 
and so forth. Of course, the the basic steel has uh, has to be produced, and of course, that's what the um, the uh, the raw material division is all about. Um, and then if we go over all the way to the side, we see beam and plate steel products uh, used in very heavy industries. Uh, beams are used in great big construction projects uh, like high-rise buildings. Uh, big uh, plate steel also can, is what they make ships out of. Um, if uh, uh, What I am looking for uh, that maybe somebody can point me to, and that is the building components. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the production of, of uh, joists and girders and the like. Maybe uh, maybe there's something here in my oh there it is all the way over on the right isn't it? So uh, fabricated construction products like joists and girders and uh, that uh, we've heard about earlier uh, are also produced and uh, whereas that used to be the uh, primary uh, business of Nucor. Now it's it's uh, it's certainly far from that. So with that, I guess we can go to goals, right? Yes. Go to the next one. Yep. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. The goal hierarchy describe how an organization or group is moved up the chain in the business sphere. Nucor Steel does business with two types, and they are basic steel and building components. They, uh, and they fall along the line of favorable market position. Acceptable risk is in most likely that Nucor will still be in business in 10 years despite the changes that are taking place within com competing products such as aluminum, carbon fibers, and carbon fibers. Superior finance results that Nucor deals closely with major customers results in low shipping costs and lower price for its customers and by practicing risk taking and being innovative Nucor is able to provide superior quality products and gain an increase in profits favorable market position is Nucor is one of the largest steel company with its yield relatively low Nucor use an electric arc many mills and that is a gain for them. Electric arcs are more flexible than the blast furnace that some of their competitors use like AK Steel. Long-term growth, new core, long-term growth is to own assets that differentiate from its competitors. New core wants to move up the value chain by expanding its position in value added steel products products substantially through profits, profitable and responsible long-term growth, Nucor is committed to being cultural and environmental stewards in the, in the community while they live and work. Nucor succeed by working together. Okay, Valerie, let me give you a little bit of, of uh, assistance here uh, because the goals hierarchy is a really important concept in this course. Uh, and <clears throat> in a, uh, it serves a couple of purposes. First of all, it recognizes that uh, firms at different positions, uh, different, uh, in the, yeah, different positions, firms with different characteristics, have different kinds of priorities for achieving success. If a company's risk is high because its uh, leverage is too high or it's technologically uh, at risk of, of being obsoleted, uh, then it's got to focus on uh, those problems uh, it, it, uh, more than uh, perhaps having to, to uh, increase market share or sales or something. They gotta, they've got to get their financial house in order or their technology house in order. Uh, if their risk is acceptable, then the next place they have to, a uh, company needs to focus on is getting superior financial results in order to reward uh, shareholders and to be able to build the financial capability to move up to the next level, which is uh, achieving a favorable market position. Uh, now, Nucor's uh, risk position is, is negligible. They've got a good financial condition. Got a little, a little bit of leverage, but uh, not a problem. 
uh, and uh, indeed financial condition is, uh, and, and I should have said also, New course technological risk is almost negligible. They're a technology leader. So uh, we look at financial results, and New is doing uh, okay. It could do better, but it's 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 uh, it's not a major problem. Uh, however, the the steel industry, for all the economic reasons that we've we've explained, is very competitive, and so it's basic steel product, the stuff that isn't the real highly uh, uh, sophisticated product uh, is is there on the playing field duking it out against the other steel producers. And so Nucor is seeking a more favorable market position. That's the, that's what it's trying to do. It's looking for, for a higher market share with larger volume. It'll get scale economy and better financial results too. Building components are uh, uh, definitely uh, the, a, a profitable line of business for Nucor. They're probably more profitable than basic steel products. The problem is there are a lot more producers of building components uh, than there are producers of basic steel products. And so although Nucor uh, has a, a very favorable position, it still it has got to be constantly struggling for a favorable position just because there's so much competition. In ultimately, if a company has a favorable market position and it's touched all those other bases, then its priorities strategically should be for long-term growth. That is to recognize that uh, this industry is probably going to go through some sort of a major technology change and uh, that's where, uh, or perhaps even a complete change in business models. That's not going to happen in the steel industry. And to the extent that it has happened, Nucor has been one of the prime movers uh, with, uh, with electric arc furnaces and continuous casting. So um, the steel industry, and Nucor specifically, is stuck in that rut of constantly struggling uh, in a battle for a favorable market position. Does that mean that Nucor just forgets all about seeking superior financial results or even favorable uh, or acceptable risk? And of course the answer is no. Uh, the goals hierarchy is a means of identifying priorities for goal setting. And once we know what the goals are, uh, or the priorities for goal setting uh, are, we also get an indication of where the priorities for forming strategy are. And it looks like uh, they all revolve around this, uh, this, uh, this uh, challenge of achieving a favorable market position, positioning the company uh, based on differentiation, low cost, uh, product development, and so forth. So, Pardon me for interrupting, but I wanted to make sure that everybody's got that really clear because this is such an important concept in the course. Would you like me to move on to the, the next slide? Sure, that's fine. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. yours? We're moving on? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Valerie. I'm, I'm sorry I barged in on you, but it looks like we were at a break point anyway there. No, sir. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, right. Jenna? Sure, so moving on to the financial goals and predictions. Um, for new core sales forecast, we recognize that this is an ambitious trend, but as Pansy previously mentioned, if Section 232 passes, the demand may far surpass the capacity and the domestic prices would drastically increase. This would contribute to an increase in sales. But we also believe that an increase in sales will come as new core has been investing in expansion um, based as noted in Value Line, the company invested $176 million to build a hot band um, galvanizing and pickling line at its sheet mill in Kentucky plant. And these upgrades and expansion are likely to um, help Nucor to increase sales and capacity. Um, additionally, as noted by Value Line, they predict that the steel industry will remain in the top of their groups with a better outlook than a year or two ago. And as the operating margin represents a portion of the company's revenue that is left over after paying those variable costs, if our goals and predictions for sales and operating margin is correct, Nucor should see an increase in their operating margin as their sale increases. Good. 
So again, the return on invested capital gives a sense of how well a company is using their money to generate the returns. And, and although the financial goals and prediction indicate an increase, in their return on invested capital, as we mentioned earlier, we look we would like to see it around that 15% or higher, preferably 20%. But neither the current numbers or the prediction numbers are really meeting this industry industry suggestion. The return on equity measurement um, measures a corporation's profitability by revealing how much profit a company generates with the money the shareholders have invested. And um, our prediction through 2021, the ROE increases. But then it seems to hold steady, offering a lukewarm growth rate to the shareholders' wealth. Okay. Uh, yeah, the return on invested capital is, is a measure of the productivity of capital. Uh, yeah, you can say uh, based on the amount of money invested, I think that those were your words. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's the capital. Uh, we, we know we've talked about invested capital is the sum of debt and equity. Uh, and uh, those are the sources of capital. The uses, of course, are working capital and the fixed and other assets. So uh, how productive uh, are the operations where that working capital is? How efficient are those fixed assets and so forth? And we've got a good trend line there. And as Jana says, uh, you know, it, if, uh, you know, I would like to see them up, uh, pushing up uh, to the 15% category. And return on equity, don't forget again, uh, uh, granted this is the uh, return on capital uh, uh, owned by the shareholders, uh, but it's uh, a, a better way to look at return on equity is is uh, is the growth rate of, of equity. It's, uh, it's uh, how, fast is equity growing as a result of retaining earnings. And uh, I'm going to bet that although this may be value lines estimate, if Nucor gets that kind of return on invested capital, we'll see the return on equity uh, go up a little faster. Uh, now that's just my opinion, but uh, that's what it is. So long-term debt, we also anticipate an increase as Nucor is investing in expansion. As mentioned in the Nucor, they plan to invest 176 million to build a hot band galvanizing and pickling line at its sheet mill in um, Kentucky. But it's also expected to take about two years to construct and to begin operation. Additionally, earlier this year, Nucor um, announced plans to upgrade a rolling mill in the Nucor still Marion a subsidiary of Marion, Ohio. Um, each of these upgrades and expansion will cost money, increasing their overall debt. So moving on to the next slide. Oh, you don't want to talk about equity. Oh, <laughs> well, we can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. So do, do, moving on. Tell me what you want to do. Do, we, do you want to stay here and talk about equity or do you want to move to leverage? We'll move on to leverage. Okay. So for um, the leverage predictions, as we mentioned, Nucor seems to be fairly conservative and likes to stay around 30%. Uh, we anticipate that leverage will decrease, but we also anticipate that they're gearing up for their next expansion or acquisition. So within the financial goals and predictions, uh, these are our predictions through 2021. And just a few things to highlight. We have an aggressive and ambitious sales growth rate of 45.9%. We also noted an operating margin increase of about 1.4%. And at 14%, Nucor will stay at the top leader among operating margins within the steel industry. Um, the ROI increase of 4.9% will bring the ROI of 2021 to about 12%. 12.5%. And again, as we talked about, the sweet spot is preferably around 20%, but 15 would be acceptable. Um, so at 12.5%, they still are not e meeting that target. And then we also anticipate a decrease in leverage of about 2.8% as they're working down their debt and obtaining more equity. Very good. Good summary. So moving to the next slide, um, our conclusions, these are really just the same things that I just talked about. Uh, within the report card um, that gives you a chance to read them. 
Oh, you want to read them or move to the next? No, no, just okay. questions for knowledge. Um, so now I'll pass it over to Valerie for the competitive position. The competitive position with Nucor, you see that Ala Arsalan Metal is at um, 29%, and Nucor is at 14%. And um, Arsalan Metal uh, faces competition, uh, comp competition from global steel producers and U US based steel. Uh, companies like um, United Steel Corporation with Norco, but you, you can see that they still um, have more shares than Norco, which is at 14%. You can move to, thank you. Um, this is a slide that shows how India is on, um, is a competitive com competition or competitive position with no core. It has a soaring demand for selections like infrastructures and real estate along with um, automobiles and homes and Whoops. abroad have put Indian steel industry on the world's map. Am I, am I looking at the right slide here? Um, yes, no. This is India. <laughs> Up yeah, here so we, had, we had the market share uh, I don't know whether this is global or U.S. market share, but I think it's global. Yes, it. Uh, is it U.S. or global? It's supposed to have been um, domestic. Um, no. This is the domestic market share, or is it global market share? Uh, no, that might I'm, be the I'm, global I'm, market I'm, share. Uh, it, it could be either, because ArcelorMetal has... Uh, quite a number of U.S. steel operations. Mm -hmm. It acquired uh, uh, Bethlehem, which uh, uh, when I was at U.S. Steel was our number one arch rival. It also acquired, uh, I believe, JNL and National Steel. So uh, it's a big player in the United States. But uh, and U.S. Steel is not such a big player uh, outside the U.S. So uh, I'm guessing that this, these are U.S. Uh, market shares. I think I'm going to put that in here uh, just so uh, if people uh, look, whoops, look at it. if somebody uh, uh, looks at this uh, recording or these PowerPoint slides uh, later, they'll, they won't be misled. Um, <clears throat> so, here we have U.S. market shares. You don't happen to know what year this is, do you, Valerie? Um, no, sir. I do not. Oh, boy. Um, okay. Well, well, Dr. Roney, I want to say that was from 2009. Oh, really? This was 2009. Wow. Okay. If I recall correctly. Yeah. Okay. So that's... Uh, so there has been some changes. There sure have yeah. been. Changes. Yeah. Um, quite a few, actually. Um, okay, uh, so then we move here, uh, and I don't think you were talking about this slide, Valerie, were you? I was talking about that slide there. Were you talking about the, the in, uh, market shares in India? Yes. Okay, go for it. I finished it. When you interrupt me, I was finishing it up. Oh, I'm sorry I interrupted you then. That's fine. That's uh, fine. I, I thought maybe you, you were talking about end use market shares. Um, I think it's very important to note that uh, the, the Indian market is really a whole lot different uh, than uh, elsewhere. Uh, and that's because the government uh, tends to uh, to support it, it domestic companies, but you can see that uh, the top five uh, players in capacity is the amount of production that they can accomplish. Uh, we don't see uh, Nucor here. We don't see U.S. Steel here, certainly. As a matter of fact, uh, it's really amazing. Uh, the, the, one of the biggest is Tata, uh, which is a uh, an Indian company. Uh, and then when we take a look at uh, the top five uh, Indian players, uh, 
uh, in terms of their global importance, uh, we see that uh, uh, the Indian uh, manufacturers uh, it, it, it must include some POSCO operations as well as Chinese operations in India, but uh, uh, the gl global market uh, is uh, dominated by firms other than those that are located in India. At least that's what I get out of this slide. Does anybody else have anything to, to, to add about this other than the fact that India is a, uh, you know, the reason we care about India is because it's the growth market of the future, right? Mm -hmm. and right, and we just thought that this was an interesting slide too because it had um, some of the competitors in it as well and they're investing monies into the mines and the steel plants within India um, because that is an opportunity for growth for Nucor. And so we thought this was an interesting representation that it had some of the competitors, but it didn't have Nucor on the map for India. Yeah, I, th I really think this is an extremely important slide. Um, and and it's simply because the growth potential of China is big. It's not, it's not like China is going to stop growing or stop consuming steel, but its rapid rate of growth in steel consumption is pretty much over. It's, it, China is becoming more mature. As that process goes on, the development, the industrial uh, and economic development of India is accelerating. And so we can look to India to be the number one uh, consumer of steel going forward. And so uh, here we see that the non-Indian companies really don't have a whole lot of influence in the Indian economy. Uh, even those uh, subsidiaries of foreign companies uh, aren't, aren't terribly important. So uh, it's a wide open uh, market uh, that is complicated by government uh, uh, controls. Uh, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how India's steel economy unfolds as time uh, moves on. Okay, now we can get to this one. This this one is just another um, slide of India's um, market shares, and uh, no coast new coast steels is not up there either. But it's just um, showing different sections of the um, constructions and the pipes and capital projects that are in um, India's market. Yeah, yeah these these are the these are the uses of steel, right? Mm -hmm. These are the industries consuming steel. Yes, correct. Yeah, these are the end uses um, for steel within the Indian the India market. Okay, and so we see the the biggest. Uh, it looks like they're tied, right? Two of them. Mm -hmm. Correct. Automotive and capital projects, which means construction. Okay. Okay. Correct. And and especially since automotive and capital projects, um, Nucor holds a lot of that within the United States, um, there is a good opportunity for Nucor um, within those in-use opportunities. Yeah, just as a, as a discussion point here, with Nucor uh, having so much experience, so much confidence in those two industries, if it could just figure out how, how to get a good position in India, it would die and go to heaven. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, but in order to do that, they're probably going to have to do what? What, would, what do you guys think? Anybody, Brittany, Hansi, Katie, how would you do that? Now, we know that, that the, the Indian government, they, they're not too friendly to outsiders. And yet here's Nucor with all this competence in those two major markets. What's, what, do you, what would you think the smart move would be here? Um, I would look into doing a joint venture with one of the um, Indian steel companies. Uh, that would probably be the easiest way to get into that market and um, start the market share there. And you, I was thinking too, you might also um, offer to educate them on some innovative ways to do things, which would build their trust with you, which therefore might get put you in a position where you could um, do a partnership. And I would think a good way to build that trust is to get one of those partnerships that Katie's talking about 
and then have a rip roaring project like uh, you know build some sort of an an industrial uh, center or you know a number of buildings and a and sort of like a a shopping center for industry you know uh, industrial plants and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, that would certainly build a lot of trust. But I think Katie nailed it. I think what, you, what, what Nucor really needs to do is go shopping for joint venture partners in India. But you sure want to get in on the ground floor in India, don't you? Yeah, they're going to okay. take care and of you. Oh. That is why I applaud you for having these slides here, uh, because they point out some of the, the complications and the challenges of, uh, of maintaining long-term growth by achieving a favorable market position in India. So here we got two places on the goals hierarchy that sort of come together. Okay, now what? You're going right to the BC, B, BCG metric. And it's, um, it's new core. The star you see um, up top is for um, RDI and the um, sheets deal. And the star represents the business unit or pr products that have the best market shares and generate the most cash sheet steel and DRIs direct and DRIs for direct reduction iron. And then we'll go to the bottom where it say the cash cow is commodity and steel products are the business unit or products that have a high market share but low growth prospect. Commodity steel products are fasten, mesh, and beans. Um, the dogs over there um, represent the product that have both a low market share and low growth rate, they, freak, they frequently break even, neither earning or consume a great deal of cash. Dogs are generally cons considered cash traps because businesses have money tied up in them, even though they are bringing back basically nothing in return. And um, to the top low up there with the ventures or um, high, um, Allo steels. These parts of the business have high growth prospect but a low market shares. However, since these business units are growing rapidly, they do have potential to turn into stars. Um, these products probably may include carbon and how um, allo steel and bars, beams, sheet plates, uh, steel piles. Um, steel joints, uh, steel deck, fabricated concrete, refor uh, reinforcing steel, coal finishing steel, steel fastener, um, metal building system, and steel grating, wires and wire mesh. And that's where your money um, is saying that's where your money would be at. Okay. Okay, uh, Doctor. Uh, all right. Uh, the, I think one, one of the good pieces of news is that uh, Nucor doesn't have any dogs. That's nice. Uh, okay, here we go. By the way, we, you could also do this uh, uh, BCG chart. Uh, now, the, the purpose of the BCG chart in, 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 when we have it in goals is to indicate where we want to be, not where we are now. Mm -hmm. So this uh, diagram might uh, uh, just as easily be in current capabilities. Uh, and then we'd have another one showing uh, what we'd like to have as an ideal BCG chart. Uh, but uh, uh, the one thing that we know for sure is that our commodity products, uh, uh, our cows, generate the cash that we can use to grow uh, these products that uh, we think have the opportunity uh, to gain uh, higher market shares and uh, uh, to, to get higher market shares in a, in a growing uh, market. Um, and I think, frankly, if we had done this with countries, uh, we might find some pretty interesting results. Okay, so off we go to strategy.
Who's doing strategy? I am doing strategy. It just took me a moment to uh, um, unmute myself. So you can go ahead to the next slide. Yes, ma'am. So we're going to talk about Nucor's generic business level strategies. And Nucor has taken a hybrid approach. Um, and they focus on both low cost and differentiation. So we want to start with the low cost. Um, we've talked about a lot of this before in the presentation. They're the largest recycler of scrap steel and scrap still can be used in the steel making process, which also goes on to the next point of them being vertically integrated. Um, by, able to con by being able to control all aspects of production, they're able to more con better control their costs. Um, and next we have the DRI, which is the direct reduced iron, which we have spoken about before. And that offers um, operational flexibility to Nucor with its low cost environment since it uses an input into steel making. Um, and as Jana had discussed earlier, uh, Nucor has the highest productivity of domestic mills. Now, if we look at the broad differentiation side, um, Nucor has a just-in-time inventory management system um, since they are controlling a lot of aspects through their vertical integration. Um, they also have the continuous casting process, which we have talked quite a bit about. Um, so we don't need to describe that anymore, I don't think. Right. Um, they also have very, very highly sophisticated operations, and that has definitely differentiated them among the U.S. steel producers. And um, although they aren't quite competing in the world, it definitely has put them um, up there with POSCO, like Jenna talked about on the technology. Um, and they also have a very broad product mix through all the acquisitions that Brittany talked about. They have so many different products from your basic steel, from fasteners, beams, strip steel. It's, I mean, almost every aspect of the steel market, they have a product in. Um, we can go ahead on to the next slide. And the next one here we have is the ANSOFT's growth matrix. Um, and this is utilized to explain a company's growth strategy. So if we want to start with the market penetration, they have the building products, value engineering. And the value engineering is um, pretty neat. It's a, a method used to improve the value of your goods or your products or services. And Nucor's really done a good job at that, uh, making sure that they have almost every product for your needs and making sure you have a good value for what you're getting. They also have the customer relation manage. Um, management with the contractors, architects, engineers, the building mm -hmm. owners. Um, it's really all in. Um, next, we have our product development, which we've talked very extensively about acquisitions, the direct reduced iron, the cast strip, the sure stride, um, the continuous casting. Um, and just a quick point out the cast strip and the sure stride, those are two. Um, goods that only Nucor produces. They have um, come up with those new technologies and they are the ones who manufacture those technologies with the ultra thin slab steel. Then we're going to go down to product proliferation, diversification, and Nucor makes new products for new markets. And that what really kicked all of that off is when Nucor acquired Volcraft. That really started everything for Nucor and getting into the steel industry. Um, and then the last little box to talk about is the market development. And we've touched on this. Um, Nucor has a very limited international presence. They do have some, and we'll show that on the next slide. But um, this is definitely an area where we want to see Nucor move into. So you see here, um, there's a, just a few locations that Nucor has. Canada, Italy, Mexico, Switzerland, the UAE, and then Trinidad and Tobago. We can go ahead on to the next slide. So we've talked quite a bit about this already, the direct reduced iron, and this is a great product to use in those electric arc furnaces. Um, and those electric arc furnaces really differentiate Nucor like we talked about because um, you're able to more easily turn those on and turn those off as opposed to the blast furnaces, which you have to keep running or else you're losing money. So it gives them a lot more flexibility to stay in the steel market, which we've talked about that is just ever changing with economic conditions, supply, demand, and other um, economic factors. Um, so by using um, the DRI in production, that's helping them achieve their low cost goals. Um, to fulfill its iron ore requirement, Nucor has the DRI plant in Trinidad, and it's located off the coast of Venezuela. 
And through this plant, Nucor has access to cheap iron ore from Brazil and natural gas from Venezuela. And then it's centrally located um, for easy shipping back to the United States. That's a good point. They've got a lot of natural gas in Venezuela. I, I, that, the, the, frankly, this is the first time anybody's uh, ever reminded me of that. Uh, so much petroleum uh, production in Venezuela, that, that, that's got to be uh, true. Uh, yeah. Great point. And of course, yeah, so it's Brazil, perfect. It's all strategically located, and it really makes sense right there for, for yeah. Newport to have all that. Brazil for iron. I see mm -hmm. we've got pig, pellets on the left and pig iron on the right. So yes. make it Thank both you. ways. Yes. Okay. Uh, incidentally, uh, and I'll, then I'll shut up. Um, when you put uh, iron, by definition, is a metal which conducts electricity. And so part of the brilliance here is that you can use this stuff. Uh, which is not, which is a different raw material than the, the molten iron that's used in a in an open hearth. Uh, this is this is uh, iron. It's it's not finely refined iron, but it's refined enough where if, when you put electricity in it and conducts the electricity, generates the heat, and and you're able to melt this uh, this pig iron. Uh, which uh, you couldn't do if, if this were, uh, were simply uh, the rock that we have to put into blast furnaces. So uh, uh, a great, great a asset to uh, making steel with electric furnaces. Thank you for um, that addition on there. Um, so next we'll move in. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> uh, Nucor is vertically integrated and we've talked about this, the inbound chain consists of securing raw materials like scrap steel, direct reduced iron and natural gas for its plants, while outbound logistics manage delivery. And Nucor has a lot of facilities across the United States, if you all remember that map from the beginning. So they're very close to their customers, so customers are able to get their goods very fast. Um, and at the bottom here is a nice pictorial representation of um, the vertical integration. You start with your raw material, it goes through the the arc furnace produced becomes a steel product and then it starts over again when the steel products their useful life is up it can be um recycled and starts the whole process over, all over again okay uh however the key point here is that nucor is vertically integrated as katie says through the whole process so we start with the raw material in this case it's pig iron and scrap uh, then we make basic steel. Uh, then we make products out of steel, including building components most prominently. And then those building, uh, and of course the, the basic steel product goes to uh, manufacturers like auto manufacturers and other manufacturers. And then the scrap, the scrap from those industries becomes the raw material again. But we make, uh, we make the raw material, we make the basic steel, and then we actually make fabricated steel products for buildings. So we are very vertically integrated in this corporation. Yes, thank you for um, hitting on all the really main points about how great they are at being vertically <laughs> integrated. It's really interesting. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, on top of being vertically integrated, um, Nucor is also horizontally integrated. Um, and this chart is just showing um, how they integrated into the basic steel market and um, the steel product market. And Brittany already discussed all of those acquisitions, so there's no need to really talk about them again. But the main point of this is that everything, they're all in the same value chain. As a result of these acquisitions and these joint ventures, Nucor has implemented a strategy of related diversification. And related diversification builds competencies and it can improve um, profitability, unlike unrelated diversification. So these are all in the same value chain. That's a really important part of the, the horizontal integration here. This is a very good slide. Thank you. Um, and so just to wrap up our strategy, um, Nucor is positioned as a low cost leader and they are differentiated through vertical and horizontal integration and they have very highly sophisticated operations. I'm um, going to expand this for the folks who look at it later on their com thank you. computer screen. 
Do I go to the next slide or? Yes, you can. I'm now going to turn it over to Brittany and she's going to wrap it up by talking about our implementation <laughs> priorities. Oh boy. So yes, last but not least, we're going to talk about the implementation priorities. Um, and a lot of these things that we've already talked about throughout the presentation, but we just wanted to hit home with these again. And these are some big um, key factors in Nucor's history and performance and why they're where they're at today. Um, so we're going to start off with Ken Iverson and the creation of the mini mill. Um, so in the late 60s, Iverson decided that Nucor should build its own steel mill to supply the steel that the company needed in efforts to save, the mon um, save their money. And we had mentioned that earlier. Um, during that time, most of the steel produced in the U.S. was made using blast furnaces, but um, Iverson decided to use an electric arc furnace instead. And this all came to life in 1969 when um, the first EAF mill electric arc furnace began operating in Darlington, South Carolina, and this is where the revolution was born. Okay, um, I need to make a fix for you here. Uh, blast furnaces were are used uh, and were used uh, where I worked at the Gary Steelworks in Gary, Indiana. Uh, we would put uh, uh, rock, you know, with iron you know, iron ore into the top of the blast furnace, and the uh, the heat in the blast furnace plus uh, some of the the coke in the blast furnace reduced, uh, did what direct reduction iron production does. It created iron, uh, liquid iron, uh, which would then be carried uh, in, uh, in railroad cars that were insulated uh, to open hearths where the steel was made. So steel, most of the steel produced in the U.S. was made using open hearth furnaces. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the blast furnaces were used to make the iron. Uh, no big shake, but we, we sorry to interrupt you. No, thank you for correcting Since that. it's so late, but uh, we, uh, we really need to fix that little glitch. Okay, let's keep on going. Okay. Do I um, flip we this can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. By, by the way, <coughs> uh, take a look at that thing in the picture. Crazy. That's an electric arc furnace that is pouring the, res the steel that it has been made, pouring it into molds or a continuous caster. Uh, but we talk about a mini mill. That's not very mini, is it? It's a, no. a pretty big thing. One of those furnaces can hold 500,000 pounds of steel. Molds yeah, it's steel. It's funny that they say those are cheaper and easier to build, but they just... They don't look like that by looking at yeah. them. Yeah, when you hear the term mini mill, you think tinker toys or something. Right. And th these are not, these tinker toys are not for children. <laughs> um, so up next, we're going to um, drive home the point about Ken Iverson and continuous casting. Um, so in the 1980s, he decided to expand new course technology, which is where the continuous thin, thin slab casting came about. Um, so this was experimental at the time, developed by German. Um, the process had never been attempted, not by the Europeans, not by the Japanese, um, not by big steel industry. It was a huge gamble, and Iverson bet his beloved Nucor that, um, and all that he had built thus far, that this gamble would succeed. Um, since then, continuous casting has evolved to achieve improved yield, quality, productivity, and cost efficiency. It allows lower cost production of metal sections with better quality due to the inherently lower cost of continuous standardized production of a product, as well as providing increased cost control over the process through automation. Um, next up is leadership selection. And leadership selection is obviously something that's important to every company. Um, not just Nucor. It's important to have the right leadership in place um, to make sure that the company is going in the direction that you want it to be in. Um, and it can be very time consuming, obviously, making sure you have the right people in place. But luckily, um, after Dan D'Amico announced that he would be stepping down, um, Nucor was able to bring in someone who had been with the company for several years to take over as CEO. And that was John Ferriola. Um, he was selected in 2013 
And as you can see, he had been with the company since 1992, serving in many different capacities. Um, and once again, as we have talked about several times, the joint ventures and acquisitions that Nucor has made um, throughout the history, they have made several famous joint ventures and acquisitions. And without these, they would not be where they are today. Okay. And last but not least, we have a recommendation for Nucor, and that is um, for global expansion. Um, Nucor needs to have a stronger presence in venture into developing economies. Not to say that they don't already have a presence because they do, but it needs to be stronger. Um, we looked at a list of developing economies and we came up with Africa, South America, and India, as we talked about earlier, um, for Nucor to look into expanding. And there are a lot of benefits associated with the entering these new markets. And um, two of those main ones would be the growth of the development, the developing economies where the demand will be greater and there will be reduced dependence on the U.S. market. Right, absolutely. And uh, we've already mentioned that India probably is our first choice. Mm -hmm. Africa's a little difficult. North Africa is where all the, the uh, turbulence is in Iraq and Iran and uh, Libya and Syria and so forth, kind of rough place to go. Central Africa is more interesting in Nigeria and Kenya. Uh, north, uh, north, uh, Ni northern Nigeria is where Boko Haram uh, holds uh, forth, and of course that's that's pretty dangerous turf. But uh, the southern part of uh, Nigeria is more attractive uh, for uh, growth, and it's a, it's 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 fairly safe. Uh, South America, our problem, of course, is that the economy, the big economies. Uh, such as Brazil and uh, Argentina, have suffered from uh, political turbulence, especially Brazil. Uh, Chile uh, happens to be uh, one of the, the more favorable uh, growth markets in South America. But generally speaking, uh, South America is uh, it, it simply, it, it's, its time hasn't, hasn't come, sort of like Africa. So when you look at the three targets here, uh, this would be a great multiple choice question, which, uh, which growth market, uh, which developing uh, market would you prefer to enter, Africa, South America, or India? Uh, I hope I, I know which, what your answer would be, uh, but mine would be India. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, well, that's it. That's the last slide. It, I was that is, yeah. Thank God for small favors. This one's gone a long time, hasn't it? Uh, it would be interesting to see how many people are still in the room. Oh, my God! There still are several. My heavens almighty. That's These people have staying power. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. A gold star. Yeah, you guys can all turn on your cameras if you want now. But uh, uh, unless you're, you're, uh, you're ladies, if you're... If your hair is in curlers, you don't have to. Uh, anyway. Uh, I put my pillow away. <laughs> uh, I think probably uh, uh, pretty quick here, I'll stop recording because converting this file into uh, a file that we can then upload into YouTube is going to be a major challenge, both for our computer and, and even for YouTube. So it's going to take quite a while to convert. So I think I'll, I'll stop recording now, although I really hate to because what happens is that with the discussion sometimes and the answers to questions that you guys out there in the uh, audience have uh, can be very enlightening. If we get into a rip snorting conversation, I'll start the recording. I think I'll pause and then I'll see if I can do something real quick. And just say goodbye to the audience out there in YouTube land. If you happen to be looking at this uh, this rather lengthy presentation, it may be lengthy, but uh, whatever you wanted to know about uh, Nucor and its strategic position, I think you, you got it in this presentation. Uh, so if you can stay awake long enough to see it, uh, you'll know everything you need to know about the strategic uh, uh, outlook for this very superior uh, maker of steel and uh, steel products. So with that,
I will turn off the recording.